So when I talk about markets first, I want to talk about why they're not fast enough, why they're not formidable, and why they don't deliver fairness, and, and why that was the, the crux that, that came out in really bold relief in Copenhagen. And when I say markets, I don't mean all markets everywhere in every nook and cranny on the planet. I mean very specifically the emerging carbon marketplace, very narrowly, very specifically. And so it's really important to keep that in mind. Since they turned on the EU, uh, the European Union Emissions Trading Scheme, we haven't seen the markets uh, quickly uh, ramp up the price on carbon. Uh, we haven't seen them quickly drive the innovation that we need uh, around the world, but particularly in Europe, uh, to check uh, the emerging emissions uh, in a really fast manner. So markets, in, again, carbon markets, emerging carbon markets, don't appear that they're that fast, quick fix that we need to get out of this problem. And why is it that we need now at this sort of moment in, in the state of the science, on the leading edge of the science, why do we need a fast uh, change and a fast correction on this? Well, a generation ago almost, uh, when they assembled uh, the Kyoto Protocol uh, way back in 1997, some, some call it ancient history, at least my students do. Um, <laughs> but even going into that before, uh, in the early 90s, when they assembled the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the state of the science was such that um, the prediction for overall Chinese emissions to exceed the U.S. was tacked out to about 2050. The prediction for CIS extent, both in area and volume, to be down near zero was tacked out to about 2,100. The Chinese exceeded the U.S. in overall emissions in 2007, three years ago, about two and a half years ago. So the evidence is bold and strong that we need fast action. We need policies that are very fast. And when you survey leading economists in Europe, you find that once you turn on a formal marketplace, so that means not in Europe because they've already turned theirs on, but that means in the U.S., maybe in a year, maybe in two years, once you turn it on, there's a lag of five or ten years before it begins to behave properly, right? So we're already ahead in terms of the catastrophe unfolding. And the leading opinion of the leading economists is that the formal carbon marketplace won't work properly. We won't see it working properly for five or ten years out from the moment you turn it on. It's not fast enough. The, the, the current emerging marketplace isn't fast enough to check the problem. And from what we know from the EU ETS's sort of very short history in time, it doesn't seem like it's formidable enough either. It's not formidable in part because it's not driving the commanding heights of industry to make changes because the formal marketplace in Europe hasn't generated a high enough price for carbon dioxide hasn't done that. Markets don't deliver justice. They don't deliver fairness. Markets deliver efficiency. Economics 101. If you want fairness, if you want justice, you need states. You need regulation. You need active oversight. If you don't have active oversight, if you don't have the state, if you don't have regulation, you don't get fairness. And why do we need fairness? Well, we need fairness when we look around we see that the unfolding climate catastrophe is concentrated. It's concentrated when you look at the 28 countries that are at the greatest risk to extreme climate change, 22 of them in Africa. When you look at not just all of the association of small island states, which is not just countries in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, but also in the Caribbean, when you look at those countries, we see that a big chunk of them, concentrated primarily in the Pacific, have actually been in negotiations with Australia and New Zealand, with other countries, to relocate people for a, about a decade and a half. So the problem of unfolding climate catastrophe is already upon us, and it's created a problem of climate injustice. So then what happened in Copenhagen, other than the expose of the fact that markets aren't delivering things fast enough, they're not formidable, and they're not fair? We got two big things that came out of Copenhagen, in addition to that revelation around markets. 
around carbon markets in particular. We've got two things. We've got a, a new mandate. And we also got an emerging new movement. The new mandate I'll, I'll offer to you was a mandate that collapsed the old divide. The old divide was rich versus poor, north versus south. The new mandate we got was the serious countries versus the not serious countries. And the serious countries I offer to you are, some are rich, some are poor. Some are in the north, some are in the south. We saw very boldly that the countries that weren't serious were the US, China, India. The serious countries, some in the north, some like Sweden leading in the EU in terms of overall emissions reductions. Leading because they sat down a few years ago and said, how are we going to go to zero? How are we going to get petroleum out of our economy? Serious. And they're working there. Serious in the South. Serious with less GDP. Serious countries also like the Maldives. They said, we want transportation, but we don't want oil. We want electricity, but we don't want coal. We're going to take our country towards zero emissions. So what did we get that wasn't serious from the US? We got a proposal in the fine print, and I was told it was a typo, so again, the lack of seriousness, you know, a typo in the, in the leading agreement. What was written in the, in the proposal that the US committed to was not even the 17% reduction off of the 2005 levels, 17% reduction in, in CO2, but Actually, in, in the text, and, and we'll see if it's a typo, it's, it's actually not on the, on the draft text that's on the, on the Secretary website right now, but it was a 14% commitment. They said to be on target, we need to be in the range of 80 to 95%, and if we're in that range, then we have a 50% likelihood of, of getting on, on point. So the non-serious countries, like the U.S., took the bottom of the range and then have been trying to worsen that bottom not serious. So we have something about the markets. We learned that they weren't fast, formidable, and fair. We had something about the new mandate. The new mandate is a divide now between the serious countries and the not serious countries. And then the third point, and lastly, we saw a new emerging movement. A movement around and for something called climate justice. And why do we see that? We saw that in part because the leading indicators of science are telling us that one, the problem is fast and formidable, but also it's happening unevenly around the globe. And that means we need to move resources quickly and to scale to places that need them the most, to places that are experiencing the problem now and yesterday, as well as countries that we know and regions of the world that we know are going to see the problem much more intensely than other places. And that's not so far away. It's certainly countries like those where my colleagues are working in the, in the South Pacific, countries like Nauru and Tuvalu, Kiribati, and so forth. But it's also even here in the U.S. Up in the North Slope of Alaska, communities, and some of you have heard of, like Kivalina, they're already planning their relocation. They filed a, a suit in federal court, a conspiracy suit against a variety of oil companies and oil service providers. That was being led by a, a former colleague of many of ours on the panel, a, a lawyer who, who, who lost his life early in the summer, a fellow called Luke Cole. Many of you in the room know him or knew him. So that's the, the crux here is about seriousness. And if you're going to be serious and if you're going to be fast and if you're going to be formidable, then not just countries but organizations got together and said, well, we need climate justice. And climate justice is about making that commitment around that sort of triumvirate of fast action, scaled formidably, and that's focused on fairness and moving resources in ways that get to those that are on the margins and countries that are on the margins really quickly. And that's the going forward out of Copenhagen. That commitment to climate justice wasn't so much one that was only made by some countries and some organizations, but in part, many people's movements, local movements, grassroots movements as opposed to astroturf or grass top movements got together and said we're going to deliver 
climate justice with other people's movements and social movements that are working on this problem and also with governments that are serious. And so one of the governments in, in Copenhagen, the Bolivians, came together and said, for those of you that are serious in April, come join us in, in Bolivia, in Cochabamba. And the invitation was one from the president. But it was one to social movements as well as to other serious countries. Come join us because we're going to begin to move this problem in a serious manner and begin to put those at the table that want to work on the problem seriously and begin to, to get on with the, the process. And so that, that's the context in which we sit.